I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Few things are more disjointing, I guess you could say, or disturbing than the tone that comes on the radio when they're doing the emergency broadcast thing. It catches everybody off guard and it just, it's just really uh, very, very disturbing uh, sound. I think they picked that particular noise on purpose to get everybody's attention. Making noise, making noise does get attention. And that's what John the baptizer was doing when he was preaching in the wilderness. He is making noise, getting people's attention and so that he could point them to Christ. That's also our job. As we are believers in this world, we too are to point to Jesus with our lives and yes, sometimes with our words. Let's think on that as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning, everyone. Please turn your attention to the top of page five in your worship folders. Advent is a time to praise. During Advent, we remember God's faithfulness and goodness to both believers and unbelievers in this world, but especially his sure and certain promise of eternal life with him in heaven to all believers. Praise 
In coming finally to the fourth candle, we give praise and glory to God for keeping his promise to send us a Savior in the holy person of his beloved Son, Jesus of Nazareth. As the light of Advent now grows to its bright and shining completion, we come near in spirit to the city of David to soon behold, through God's word, the blessed nativity of Christ, the supreme miracle of the ages. Please join now in the opening hymn, the first three verses. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, 
grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. O heavens above, rain down righteousness, and the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide, let salvation spring up. Praise the Lord. O God, Father in heaven, your heart, O God, is grieved, we know, by every evil, every woe. Upon your cross forsaken Son, our death is laid and peace is won. O Son of God, Redeemer of the world, your arms extend, O Christ, to save from sting of death and grasp of grave. Your scars before the Father move his heart to mercy at such love. O God, Holy Spirit, O lavish giver, come to the aid of the feeble child your grace has made. How to make us grow and help us pray, bring joy and comfort and come to stay. Please be seated. Let us give glory to our God. Stir up your power, Lord Jesus, and come. Be merciful to us and forgive our sins. Help us rid our lives of everything that hinders our salvation. We ask this in your name, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Our 
Old Testament reading for this morning is given to us by Moses in his final book, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Oh, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see his great fire any more, or I will die. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen, like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words when he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm portion comes from Psalm 119, 111. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. Our epistle is given to us by St. Paul as he writes to the Philippian congregation, chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This too is the word of the Lord. The Lord is near to all who call to him, to all who call on him in truth. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. Hallelujah. Let us rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today comes from the writer John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him then, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, No, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, No. And then they said to him, Who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where, God was, where John was baptizing. Here ends the gospel. We confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and join in the hymn of the day. Grace, peace, mercy, and truth be multiplied unto you through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Amen. God's word for our study briefly this morning is given to us in our gospel reading using this verse. Verse 23, where John answers, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as Isaiah the prophet said. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight, or strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, did you get the first warning? If you got the paper, you did. The local paper. 
but it's also been uh, on uh, various online sites. The warning, I say, about extensive road work that's going to be done along our highways here, especially the junction there of 90 and 92. Kind of everybody in town passes through that intersection at one time or another. Can you imagine when they start ripping the whole thing up? We're all going to have to find different ways to get around. It's not going to be fun. But we hope in the end will be worth it. We won't have to take our cars in for realignment quite so often. We know what to expect, don't we? We know it's going to take months and months. We know that the way it's going to be done probably won't be real efficient. We know there will probably be stoppages from time to time. But we have the warning. We know what to expect and so I think maybe possibly we can be ready for it. The words that we get are both a warning but also a, a reason for us to rejoice so that we don't have the problems that we have had recently. That's a lot like what John is doing here. He's being the herald of both warning and rejoicing. John's job is not easy. Our job in proclaiming Christ, even at this wonderful festive time of the year, is also not easy. God's message to us this morning is yet to cry out. To cry out as Isaiah did, to cry out as John did, to cry out indeed as Jesus himself did to cry out as the apostles and early Christians did. In other words, to make some noise. Make some noise for Christ. Okay, so who's, who's doing the crying here uh, in this quote from Isaiah that uh, John records? These words are directly from God. Specifically, it is God's Son who is speaking here in Isaiah. So when John says, I am the voice of one crying, notice John does not say, I am the one crying. He doesn't say that because he's not the one. He's the voice of one. In other words, he's preparing the way for the Messiah. He spoke God here in the guise of Christ, the Messiah, first into Isaiah and then to many other Old Testament prophets. And they were indeed crying out, trying to get the attention of people. This is the only voice of God that we must listen to, the voice here in Holy Scripture. God does not come in dreams, my friends. God does not come in visions except to those already mentioned in Scripture. God comes only now in these latter days, in these last times. God comes only in His Holy Word, the Holy Scriptures. There is where the crying is done. And our crying needs to mimic that crying. It needs to match the Word of God in every point of teaching, in every point of doctrine. Jesus himself proclaimed often in his ministry that he was the truth and that he spoke the truth and only the truth. And that is what you find in the pages of the Bible is truth. Directly from God's mouth to our ears, to our brains. Huh? God's absolute truth. So when you cry out, when you talk about Christ, make sure you are talking about the truth. Every faithful preacher, every faithful teacher, every faithful believer that speaks about Jesus to anyone must speak the truth. Okay, so what is this truth? Well, again, John says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. Now, the Lord's way doesn't need to be made straight. 
it's not can't mean that because he's perfect. He is God, and Christ was God and is God, and so his way is perfect. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the way in front of, the way before, the way uh, to prepare. All right, to prepare for the coming, to make ready a road for God, a clear path, as it were, right into our hearts and minds. And what do you have to do in order to clear? A path. What do you have to do in order to clear the decks? You have to get everything out of the way. What do we have to get out of the way, folks? We have to get out sin out of our ways. And so the first thing to do when you're preparing the way of the Lord, when you're getting the road in front of Him, not His road, but the road, your road in front of Him, when you're getting that ready, you're repenting. You're getting rid of, first of all, spiritual indifference. That's what this world has more than anything else. Spiritual indifference. People simply do not care right now today about God. It's not that they don't believe in Him. Maybe they would believe in Him if they thought, uh, if they cared uh, very much. They don't care. Nobody seems to care about hell anymore. Nobody seems to care about displeasing God anymore. Nobody seems to be at all concerned about Jesus coming back and assigning them to the flames of perdition. That seems to be the furthest thought from their mind. Oh, God's okay with me. It doesn't matter what I do or what I say or how I act. That's okay. God's a big guy. He's got thick skin. He'll just overlook it. Well, the fact is, he'll overlook a lot of things except unbelief. That he will not overlook. Unbelief is blasphemy to God. Unbelief is saying God doesn't exist and that God hasn't done the great things that he has done. And so we've got to get rid of that false security. We've got to get rid of that spiritual indifference, that self-righteousness. We've got to, we need to re. We need to turn around and think an opposite direction. That goes for us as well as the unbelievers out there. We need to do that every day. What did Luther say? Luther said, daily we need to drown the old Adam in repentance. Huh? That old Adam is always clawing to the surface. That old Adam is always getting up there and trying to make us follow the way of the devil. He's always there, and so repent is the best way to go. That's why John, his message, and Jesus, his message at the first also was, repent, for the kingdom of God is right coming right now. The kingdom of God is right at hand. You know, we don't know when the kingdom of God will actually show up. We don't know when Jesus will show up. He could show up five seconds from now. He could show up 500 years from now. We don't know which. But we need to be prepared, and the way to be prepared is to be in a mindset of repentance, to be in a mindset that understands, yes, we have sinned before God, and yes, therefore, we ask God's forgiveness. We believe in the forgiveness of Christ, and we believe in his sacrifice to cover the sins of the whole world, everybody included, including us. You see, in order to have a Savior, folks, you got to need a Savior first. Hmm? And we need one just like everybody else. We're not above everybody else. We're not better than anybody else. We're not higher than everybody else. We're not more holy than everybody else. No, not at all. The difference between us and everybody else out there, all the unbelievers, is simply that God has created faith in our hearts with the words of Scripture and with baptism and strengthen it with the Lord's Supper and with absolution. We have the Word of God. We have the means of grace, the Word of God, the Gospel in Word and Sacrament. That's what we have. That will make difference. And where do you get that? You get that in church. huh? And so the problem with our society is not simply that people aren't filling the churches anymore, but people don't care to fill the churches anymore. Hmm? They really don't. doesn't matter to them anymore. Okay? Why? Because they don't think they need it. Well, we know different, don't we? Now, this is, of course, impossible to do by ourselves. We can't come to this by our own thinking, or as Luther said, by our own choosing. Hmm? We can't even begin this test. The Holy Spirit has to do the heavy lifting. 
The Holy Spirit has to be the ones that brings us to God and cleanses our hearts. And then, what is our next step is not to clutter it up again. How do we clutter it up again? You know what? We clutter it up again with the things of this world. See, that's the problem with Christmas nowadays. I think we all know that. I think we all understand the problem is that it gets cluttered, the worldly with the spiritual. You know, the, the idea of St. Nicholas who did exist and did good things. Why? Because he was a believer, because he appreciated the salvation that was given to him by Jesus Christ, gets all mixed up with cinder clothes. Hmm? Gets all mixed up with Father Christmas. And the two kind of get all jumbled together. It's our job, folks, to keep them separate. You know, there's a lot of people out there claim the title Christians who would condemn us for having a tree here. Ooh, that's a pagan symbol. And this a pagan symbol. And all kinds of other things are pagan symbols. Oh, isn't that terrible? Okay, that's not the point. It's not the issue whether you can't have Santa Claus if you want to, or St. Nicholas, or the Christ child, or the babe of Bethlehem. Okay, that's not the issue. The issue is, okay, let, you know, what did Jesus say? Huh? Huh? Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and under God that which is God's. Okay? So, hey, why don't you do that with your own life? Render under Santa Claus what is Santa Claus's. And render under Christ what is Christ's. All right? Okay? And so we have our worship services for that. We have our worship service uh, uh, regular Sunday one, of course, today. But tonight we got a worship service, right? And that worship service and the worship service in the uh, Monday morning uh, are both centered on Christ. It's not that one is centered on little kids. Granted, we don't have a lot of little kids. But it wouldn't matter whether we had 30 kids in our Sunday school or two, Okay. The point is not that it's not centered on the kids and it's not centered just on a bunch of nice little Christmas carols. That's not the issue. The issue is you come here tonight to worship Jesus. And you come here in the morning to worship Jesus. That's what you do. It's not that one is for one group of people and one is for another. One is for old young families and people with a bunch of kids and whatever. And the other, well, that's for us old folks. No, not at all. Okay, both services. That's why I ask every voters meeting, folks, every voters meeting in November before the, the holidays start, I always ask the same question. You guys, you want two services or just one? Okay, you want Christmas Eve and Christmas morning or you just want Christmas Eve or just Christmas morning? Which do you want? And Every time, without fail, the people always say, Oh, pastor, do both! And then what happens? Twenty people show up at the evening service expecting the place to be filled with visitors. Well, you know, let me tell you something about visitors. I'll tell you something about visitors. I've been in this business for 42 years. Okay, and I'll tell you something about church lookers. People that come to looking for church, so some place to go to church for the rest of their lives. One of the things that they do when they walk in the door is look around. And if they look around and they see the place totally empty, they say, this ain't the place for me because the people here don't even care enough to show up. Eh? And then, of course, we have the different 20 people or maybe the same 20 people show up in the morning. Okay, that's fine. That's great. That's wonderful. Love them. You know me. I'll show up if there's two people here. You know, that's, that's my thing. I get paid the same no matter what. But where's our crying out? Where's our voice in the wilderness? And let me tell you, man, this world out there is a wilderness. And it doesn't just need our voice. It needs our example. All right? It need, your neighbor needs to see you taken off at 5.30 this evening and 9 o'clock in the morning to get here. Yeah, that's the fact, Jack. So who is, uh, who is John speaking to here in Isaiah 2, for that matter? Those in the wilderness, those in the desert, 
That's where a lot of the crying takes place. What is that? Well, I'll tell you what that is. That's the world. It's the world separated from God and paradise. It's the world on the other side of the angel with the flaming sword, turning this way and that and keeping people away from doing even more damage to themselves. It's the world out there where Adam and Eve started their living and where Cain killed Abel. That's where the world is. Separated from God. It's the world of souls and sinners. By believers who are struggling with the old Adam like you are. And by unbelievers who are wandering through life without light, without hope, without heaven. My dear Christian friends, what blocks so many people, so many of us, from a fuller, richer, better, more peaceful, more glorious life in Christ? What keeps unbelievers from listening and from following Christ? I'll tell you what it is. It's that same stubborn human pride and sinful arrogance. Refusing to admit that we need God, not just once or twice a week for that matter. We need God every day and every moment of our lives. My dear friends, please. Get the rocks out of your road. Fill the potholes and the ruts. Repair your highway before the Lord. We need to fix the curbs and gutters of our lives. We need to straighten out the curbs. We need to get the highway of our hearts ready for the returning Christ. And the best way to do that is to worship the first coming of Christ. Because worshiping the first coming of Christ reminds us that he's coming back again. And so I say to you today, in your life, in your prayers, in your actions, in your words to neighbors and friends and family, let's make some noise, eh? Let's do a little crying out there in the wilderness. Let's do it about Christ. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in true faith through Christ Jesus your Lord. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Dear God and Father, we give you praise for all your goodness and tender mercies. We thank you for the love which sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son through whom you have made known your grace. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, for your holy church and the means of grace, for the lives of all godly people and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness by lives that are given to your service. Defend your holy church, give her ministers a great measure of your Holy Spirit, and strengthen her through the word and sacraments. And unite your people and all the world in the one holy Christian church that they may bear witness to your love. Preserve our nation in honor and continue your blessings to us as a people that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives. 
Grant health and wisdom to all that hold office and call them to know and obey your holy will. Give all people a Christ-like mind. Remove all hatred, prejudice, and whatever hinders peace and justice. Sanctify our homes with your light and joy. Keep our children in the true faith and enable parents to raise them to a life of godliness. Bless farming and trade, industry, along with the arts and culture of our people. Give protection to those whose work is difficult and dangerous. Comfort with your mercy all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or adversity. Protect those who suffer persecution for the faith. Grant peace to those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us, O Father, for his sake, who died and rose again, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray in his name, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I call it despising the sacrament. If one allows a long time to elapse and with nothing to hinder him, yet never feels a desire for it. If you wish such liberty, you may as well have the liberty to be no Christian, neither to believe nor pray. But if you wish to be a Christian, you must from time to time obey this command of Christ. Our engagement may now come forward for the Lord's Supper. Take and eat, this is the true body of the Lord. This is his bloodshed for you. I will strengthen and support you in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat. This is the body of your Lord, sacrificed for your sins. Take and drink, this is the blood of your Lord shed for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up unto death, even the death of the cross, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the body of your Lord, sacrificed for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ, shed for your sins.
Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of all of your sins. blood of Christ shed for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given up for you on the cross for all of your sins. This is the body of your Lord, given for you for your sins. and eat. This is the true body of your Lord given up for you on Calvary's cross. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given up for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the blood of your Lord shed for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true and saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in God's peace. Amen. Please join now in the Nunc Dimittis. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, 
who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule in our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Please join now in singing the last and four remaining verses of the first hymn for our closing hymn. Please be seated.
A very good morning once again to everyone. Good to have you here, as always. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, today, being a holiday weekend, there's no fellowship or in the fellowship hall, uh, and there's not very much coffee left either, so don't bother. Okay? Nothing, nothing, nothing for you to get. Uh, we do continue, though, this coming week with Bible class on Tuesday. That will be held, as usual, at 10 o'clock. And then tonight, we have a service, uh, 6 o'clock, mostly, as I said, carols and readings. And then tomorrow morning, 9.30, uh, a communion service using Martin Luther's uh, uh, common service. That will be, again, 9.30 tomorrow morning and 6 o'clock this evening, carols and readings. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning.